Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Lo-Fi History on this lovely Tuesday afternoon with Glenn. Hello, Glenn. Hello. And Marie. Hello, Hi. Marie. And I am Libba. Hello, if, Libba. Hello, Libba. <laughs> and if this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, this is your chance to ask historians Glenn and Marie uh, your history questions. So all you have to do is chat your history questions and we will answer them live. But to begin with, we always have some fancy costumes or uh, <clears throat> historical attire, historical yes. garments uh, with Glenn and Marie. So Marie, let's start with you as usual. So tell us about what you are wearing today. So I have decided that I wanted to look like I came out of a Jane Austen novel today. Uh, so I am wearing what you would call Regency attire. That is uh, attire that is, uh, well, we say Regency, it, that refers specifically to the Regency of uh, the, well, King George Regency period. So Georgian and Re Regency kind of overlap a bit, but that is the end of King George reign. We call it Regency in English history that kind of leads over to America. Sometimes it's also called the Jane Austen era because it is the era in which Jane Austen wrote or the early 1800s in America, we call it the Federalist period. <laughs> so all names for the early 1800s. Um, very notably, it has the empire waist, which means it is just like, just, just right here. It's not at your actual waistline. It is uh, much more, much higher on the torso, right under the bosom, uh, is where that line is drawn. And then it's just very free flowing underneath, which is very different than the fashion that comes before it. It's a very stark break in fashion because people did not want to look like people from the 1700s, most notably those who had been in the French Revolution who had lost their heads. Yeah. So you have this very stark break. You have a lot of revolutions, a lot of social upheaval. Fashion, of course, follows politics and uh, social goings on. It's a very much a social form of self-expression. So you have Regency. Uh, I have, of course, my, my dress with the, sometimes it's called an empire waist. It was made very fashionable in Napoleon's empire in France. Mine has some long sleeves. This is more of a, a day dress. It has a little, still a fichu. It's a different look for the fichu, but still the same. There's a lot of kind of meshing of Georgian, old Georgian things that kind of get thrown into Regency, uh, early 1800s that get carried over. Fichu's kind of one of those or a tucker. Um, then I have my bonnet, which is very 1700s, but I have a new form of, well, my, my cap, I should say, is under my bonnet. The bonnet is much more of a late 1700s, early 1800s fashion. So the, it sounds like folks were like, hey, all those people who aren't doing us great. Uh, oh, thank you so much for the follow of Fed's Baskin. Thank Huzzah! You so <laughs> Yay, thanks for the follow on, on Twitch. Uh, but you're saying it was sort of like a way to express dis <laughs> in, a, in a very light way, distaste, we'll say, for uh, the elite during the French Revolution. So it sounds like we're going from very big extravagant mm -hmm. dresses. And now, if I recall, you said it was sort of taking note from Greek. Yes, mm -hmm. so it has very much a Greek uh, or Roman silhouette, and you kind of want to look like a column. <laughs> That's your goal when you're in something like like uh, this this time period. It, the fashion goal was to look like a column. Uh, this is a time where democracy is coming back into fashion, really, hearkening back to that ancient Greek, ancient Roman ideals uh, that are coming back, especially in America, it's coming back in architecture as well. You have the Greek Revival, which gets into the 1820s, 1830s, gets very popular with physical architecture. I like to think of dresses as fabric architecture, uh, and you also have that Greek-inspired coming back into fashion with uh, th these dresses. Very cool. And, and have, never having worn a dress like this myself, yeah. Um, isn't it sort? Isn't it a literal and figurative breathing space between areas when the times when the foundation garments were 
forming and constricting, and this doesn't have that, right? It can and cannot. So that's the interesting thing. There are short Regency stays, which only go to, to here. Um, it only covers uh, the very short. Like they're, but they're, they're like, they're like this big yeah, instead of like. It's like a modern bra. Uh -huh. And then you also have long Regency stays which are also still worn under this, but they go through the entire torso. So it really is a personal choice if you have long stays or short stays. Um, no one ever knows what's necessarily being worn under the dress. But if you have longer stays, they are not as, as tight. You still have a busk in it, which is just basically a stick, like a long stick just in the front uh, to help it keep its, you know, it, its shape. There, But they are still not as structured of garments as that you would have, because uh, they're, they're called short stays or long stays. They're still stays, but they are not as heavily boned or constructed as you would have in the 1700s. Oh, Mid. very cool. Yeah. Right. All right, nice. So we've got Regency era, beautiful dress that, of course, I'm sure you made. I did. I also made this part. Oh, cool. You made the hat? I don't normally make hats, but I tried my hand at millinery this time. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> nice. nice. And Glenn, tell us about what you are wearing, and then we will dive into your questions. I am a, well, I'm dressed as a <laughs> World War I doughboy, an American soldier sent over to fight the Hun and send them back packing to Berlin. <laughs> you know, we won't come home until it's over, over there. Send the word, send the word. We're going to save the uh, save the world. Not the same as we do later, but but it's still very much the Wait, same. Wait, so this is World War One. This is right? World War One. Okay. Yes. Notice World how War it still I. looks. It's all still wool. It has the high collar. Um, Americans love their peacetime uniforms that look great, and then they usually discard them uh, like that once the war starts. Except we weren't in this one long enough to discard this look. So this is what <laughs> this is what we had. Very cool. And I see we have Karen. Hello, Hello. Karen. And Olivia. Hello, hey. Olivia. Olivia. And David. Hi, David. Hello. And Fev, who is our new follower on Twitch. Uh, uh, greetings from Turkey. Very cool. Whoa. Welcome. Wow. <laughs> so we've got whales in the house. We've got a lot of U.S. folks in the house. And now we've got Turkey. That is so cool. <laughs> Karen says we need a gla uh, sunglasses sponsor. I, I know. That's <laughs> that would be great. Excellent. And David says, on behalf of whales, the mammals, I thank a woman for giving up corsets. <laughs> so let's see. Our first question is, uh, I think this one's definitely directed at you, Marie. Karen wants to know, what is your favorite Jane Austen book? And what is your favorite Jane Austen movie? Ooh. All right. So my favorite book is Sense and Sensibilities. I do love the BBC two-part production of Sense and Sensibilities. Um, I'm not sure if that counts as, perhaps, it counts as a production. I don't think it counts as a movie, though, because it's well, still a we're, two part. We're the host here, so it does. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we set right. the guidelines. Sorry. Yeah. All right. So, yes, if that's your favorite. All right. Well, Sense and Sensibilities is my favorite, but I, and, and I do really love that production, but I think perhaps the newest Emma adaptation movie might have stolen my favorite. My favorite place. I want to see that. Favorite. I haven't it's seen it yet. It's so good. Okay, good. It breathes life into the <laughs> humor of Jane Austen. Okay, cool. A lot of times, I feel like people attempt to, to you know, push their, their you know, glasses mm -hmm. up their oh. nose and <laughs> stare down, and they're like, "This is literature. Yes, we must it's drab, and we're only going to be <laughs> very serious. Deliver about everything this. dryly. Yes. yes. Um, whereas. <laughs> Jane Austen has such humor, and especially Emma, which is just the most ridiculous character you have ever met, who tries so hard and ends up failing most of the time. I don't, um, I honestly didn't like the the movie or the story much when I saw like the old Emma movie, because I was like, oh, like, what's, what's this? Yeah. But I think that was the one with Gwen Gwyneth Paltrow. Mm -hmm. um, but this new one, the costumes are fantastic. The acting is great. The cinematography is beautiful. Yeah. And I really love how they captured the humor of Jane Austen Very and cool. Emma. So we got, uh, if you haven't read any Jane Austen, maybe start with Sense and Sensibility, perhaps, yeah. as that I is your like favorite. Everyone always says Pride and Prejudice. And yeah. Pride and Prejudice is fantastic. It is. I understand why it's like almost everyone's favorite. Right. But... <laughs> 
I have a special place in my heart for Sense and Sensibilities because it was, I think, one of her earlier writings. It was before Pride and Prejudice. And the two sisters who are just, you know, all rational and all passion, I just, I love their their relationship to each other and how they foil each other. And I, I, just, I think it's a great, great story that sometimes gets overlooked. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Jane Austen movies, Susan says they didn't seem to wear any layers under the skirt of their empire dress and their legs would show through when they were outside in the sun. Did they really not wear any petticoat under the skirt? Was this not considered indecent at the time to be able to see through the fabric of the skirt? I'm not I don't know if that's just a movie sure thing or what. what you're referring to because people definitely wore petticoats. <laughs> So yeah, maybe in this movie they may have missed the mark on something. Yes. <laughs> uh, another thing that is great about the Emma, the newest Emma movie, they show the them getting dressed or oh, dancing cool. around in their undergarments, <laughs> and like they're good. I think personally nice. for for historical movie costumes, you're actually like, whoa, those are short stays, those are long stays, and they're wearing petticoats <laughs> under them with a shift. Amazing! So, for under the stage, you would have a shift. Mm. Shift does not always, it does not go down to, you know, your ankles. It usually goes to the knees. And then you would have a petticoat on under it. Sometimes it's, like, basically a whole un underdress. Sometimes it only, like, comes up to where the waistline is and then fastens under there. With well, little suspenders sometimes, especially in this era, because otherwise it's going to probably sink down to your waist. Um, you want it to be full uh, under here. You want you want to make sure it's poofy and, and yeah. billowy and column-like. So, uh, yes, people would definitely wear shifts and stays and petticoats. Um, perhaps not as many petticoats as we see in the 1840s and 1850s. That's when people start to wear an exuberant amount of petticoats. <laughs> that then give way to the hoop skirt because people are like, this is too many petticoats. <laughs> like, I can't walk. Um, but yes, people did definitely wear, wear petticoats. There was a, the more risque, um, which is not the larger part of the community, uh, but some people did. They just kind of wore sheer dresses. They were called... Uh, Basically, they were kind of like the punks of the, the Regency <laughs> era, and it was called like a la guillotine, and they had like red ribbons that they would tie around their neck, and they would cut their hair short, and they Whoa. wore basically see-through dresses. <laughs> so like, it happened, but that's like a very- Not very, in the upper class. Yeah. And probably not in the middle class. No, it, I, but all, it was a very, very small fragment of society. Which would, the, would do that. The lunatic fringe. Yes. Uh, there was a whole lot more bosom going on. Uh, lots of bosom. Uh, we think of Victorians as kind of more... Uh, modest. Modest. Yeah. Um, but in the Regency era, uh, if you were not worried about sun exposure, so like, you know, at night or at court, uh, if you're, you know, inside most of the day, um, you, you could show as much skin up here as you wanted, really. It's All right. Like, <laughs> yep. Well, very cool. All right, thank you for your questions, Karen. And next question comes from Olivia. And this this is a good one, but a big one. So Ooh. She's good at the big ones. She are, you are good. <laughs> you are. So Olivia asks, if you could have five people to help you start a nation, who would you choose? <laughs> Perhaps figures from history Ooh. to start a nation. Well, I'm going to start with me because I definitely want to be there, right? <laughs> and I'm but sure yeah. you mean to help me so I don't yes. count as the five. Yeah. <sighs> and while you're thinking, I'll just remind our audiences <laughs> that <laughs> we, uh, we actually <laughs> extended our March donation goal. It was originally 250. Y'all helped us get there. Thank you so much. But... Uh, we are trying to reach 300 by the, I guess by Thursday, by, by the end of tomorrow, to reach our extended uh, March donation goal. I will put the link in the chat, and this is a special March donation goal because you'll be automatically entered into our raffle to win a $15 gift certificate to our online shop, which we have lots of really good stuff there. <laughs> so, now that you've had... Uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> Glenn, I want to start with you. Who comes to mind first? <laughs> 
Cicero Solian, Solon, John Adams, Elizabeth, and see, I would say Napoleon because any nation starting up is going to have to have a good general to kind of help defend the new nation. But Napoleon is not the guy you want doing that because he was there for France when they start they were starting a new nation, and then poof, he's emperor. So you want people that are going to work together, right? You want to you want people that are assuming that we want some sort of representative uh, government, uh, which uh, which is the assumption I'm going on. Yeah. By the way, um, <laughs> you don't want to be a tyrannical. Dictator? I don't want to be a tyrannical uh, tyrant, but I also don't. I don't know. When you, when uh, you say Elizabeth, what what Elizabeth? Yeah, which Elizabeth? Oh, the the the, the, the first. Oh, okay. The first, cool. because we have to have representation, right? Mm-hmm. We got to represent. Um, you know, Solon the lawgiver, he was one of those first people who said, we have to have laws. Here are some good ones that seem to govern uh, things. Who else did I say? Uh, did you say Thomas Jefferson? No, no I said, said John, John Adams. Adams. John Adams. Cicero? Kind of, I said Cicero because Cicero is going to give our good speeches, right? <laughs> Cicero is going to coalesce all of our thought into the verbal word, and then him and John Adams will be able to wrestle back and forth because... While Cicero believed in the Republic, he did kind of get long-winded, and so does John Adams, and John Adams <laughs> would get fed up. However, John Adams has the experience of a few more hundred years to, of things to look at that Cicero does not. True. Um, I'm still thinking of the military person, which mm-hmm. you would think I would leap out and pick anyone, but that if you're trying to have someone there at the beginning for a good representative government, you have to be careful. George Washington seems the obvious choice, but remember... He never won a battle. <laughs> Except Yorktown, the last one, and he had a whole lot of French help with that. So I love I love uh, Georgie Porgy, but he's not my number one choice if I'm getting to pick. He also from started all of his, the French and Indian War on accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. someone told him to. He just, yes, but he was bumbling and didn't yeah. know what he was getting into. Um, Hannibal, he's there. Hannibal's my military guy. Gosh. Who is Hannibal? Who is Hannibal? I only the, know the other Hannibal. He is, uh, you're thinking of Hannibal Lecter. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hannibal was a Carthaginian um, son of Hasdrubal who led the Punic forces in the Second Punic War against Rome and was able to unite a wide variety of different peoples, cultures, and societies to fight against Rome and for almost 20 years was able to hold off all the armies of Rome and he was not able to defeat them in the end, but he had some of the most perfect and genius battle plans ever, and people still study them and try to replicate them, even low, until this very day. Oh, wow. Nice. Now, do you have any idea what your nation would be called? Uh, Glendonia. Glendonia. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, Marie, who would be your five nation makers All of right. history? And for the record, I was having to do that off off the top of my head, Olivia. I may, yeah. I may come back next week and having thought about it. We'll do a whole live stream on it. Yeah, yeah we'll do a whole live stream. Um, all right, so my five are going to be Thomas Jefferson. Um, I also want Elizabeth the First. No. <laughs> I also want Eleanor Roosevelt. Ooh. Go ahead. No, it's your, <laughs> it's your pick. It's your pick. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about your pick. Um, uh, I want uh, George S. Patton. Ooh, yeah. And I still have one more, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Let's see. <sighs> <laughs> Olivia, you put them in a tough situation. Um, I feel like I, I don't have someone to handle speeches yet. Hmm. I need a good PR, like, public face. Well, yeah. I guess Elizabeth could do that. It's pretty good. First. <laughs> um... I'm going to go, I'm just going to like, go with someone else. Fev recommends Eisenhower. Not sure what your opinion on Eisenhower is, but. Could work, could work. Could work, 
I like I I'm just missing one person. Let's see. I'm just let's you know go Frederick with... Douglass was an excellent uh, orator. Oh, true, true, true. true. Let's do Frederick Douglass. I like a, him. You know, Aww. let's throw in Frederick. I'm Douglass. taking Frederick Douglass. All right, nice. I, I like that. Now, now, who do you do you have a recommendation, Glenn? For Marie's five. No, no, no. I mean, th- those are f- those are fine. I wish I thought of Frederick <laughs> Douglass. Oh, oh okay. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we'll just go with what we've got. <laughs> all right. And we'll, we'll up, form two different nations. Well, two with different all nations. Of Glendonia we'll see which and, one is better. And Marie, what would yours be called? Oh, um, the independent state of. The United Peoples. <laughs> the independent state of the United Peoples. Yes. I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds eerily familiar. <laughs> its initials would be eye soup. We like soup. It's our national dish. That's okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Olivia. That was, uh, that was an enlightening and difficult I want question. her to think about who she would pick and get back yes. to us. Yeah, yeah, right. Olivia, and You only have us. three minutes to think about it, That's too. That's right. Yep. So, Olivia, chat us who your <laughs> top five nation builders would be. All right, our next question comes from Karen. Karen asks, did Richard III kill the princes, uh, his nephews? Um, now, I don't know the context for this question, so maybe... Who wants to take this one? Introduce the context and let us know. So, okay. yes. Yeah, so the the princes are uh, Edward and I can't remember the other one. I'm sure it's something Englishy. Um, <laughs> they were technically the heirs to the throne, right? Of uh, of Richard's brother, and Richard, yes. however, was named one of the regents. And they were captured, and here's the story. Uh, the, they were put in the Tower of London, and they were murdered, which allowed Richard to become king because he had his nephews murdered. And right? what, what time period is this? 14. Oh, wow. Uh, late 70s, early 80s. Yeah, <laughs> in the 1400s, 14, yeah. Yeah, the late, yeah, 1470s, 1480s is when all this goes down. Um and, you know, it's the very, very end of the War of the Roses. They had pretty much settled down by this point, to be perfectly honest. But that was, that's the, uh, you know, that's that's the, the view on Richard is that, now, the nephews did die, right? Somewhat mysterious uh, surroundings, but we don't know that he killed them or actually had them killed. A lot of that comes from later. A lot of people did not want Richard to be king. And so, and you know, here's the thing. And Henry VIII, it's Henry VIII, yeah. William Shakespeare. <laughs> a little different. <laughs> Real. Slightly William, different people. <laughs> William Shakespeare was writing plays to please the Tudors, which had come to power after the Richard III. So they had to make Richard III look bad. Right, so he writes these histories and makes, and this is you know Richard the Third. He's the, he's slumped. Hunched he's got a, back. he's got a hunchback. Yeah. Evil. He's evil. Yeah, if he had a mustache, he would twirl it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you know in that play, he he does have the murdered. He has his uh, brother murdered. Has Clarence murdered? All these different people are killed so that he can become king. And then finally, uh, oh, um, Owen Tudor comes in. Not Owen Tudor. That's not his name. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, Henry Tudor. I'm thinking of Henry Tudor. Henry Tudor, who becomes Henry VII, Mm -hmm. comes in, defeats Richard, takes the the crown of England, and becomes the Tudor dynasty rather than the Plantagenet-ish dynasty. All that said, Richard III got a very bad rap through history due in large part to Shakespeare's plays. So we come forward to the present day, and what evidence do we have? Well, they finally did find Richard III's uh, tomb under a car park, right? This was, what, seven or eight years ago? Yeah. Maybe ten. I can't remember. But they they found, they confirmed it's Richard III, right? Wow. wow. When they found him and they were uh, excavating his body from, a you know, with archaeological practices, his spine did indeed have severe scoliosis. I was wondering, wow. Severe scoliosis. And so people are like, huh, 
he he probably did walk strangely and have and, uh-huh. and have this you know sort of a limping hunch when he moved around because of this. Um, but we still don't know if he killed the princes. They did find in excavating the tower. They did find two small children's bodies under one of the stairways when they were doing renovations in the Tower of London. Which they are pretty sure, but they have not confirmed necessarily. Right. There's... But they're like pretty sure. Wow. As the princes. Yeah. Wow. But okay. we're in so, the tower. We don't know for sure. You but... could prove it in a civil case, but not a criminal <laughs> case. That's Perhaps. a good way to put it. There you go. <laughs> but they do have the body, so there has been a crime. Right. Yeah, right. right. You could argue in. It's up to the jury. Yeah, well, yes, exactly. Uh, um, but yeah, I, poor poor Richard. Are you are you an anti Richard? I am anti Richard. Oh. I think he he if he did not personally kill them himself, he had he's, ordered someone else to do well, it. Well, he's definitely got people for that. Yes. Right? Yeah. If he didn't do it himself, he had someone else do his dirty work and killed the two children. Was uh, that like in the ugh. Bloody Tower? It's literally called the Bloody Tower. Ugh. Well, vicious. I mean, post mortis. The Tudors helped with that name a lot more than Richard did. Well, no, but that's where the <laughs> two children I'm were murdered. I'm just saying. Now, who, who, we have a Susan asking who put the um, the princes in the tower. Or oh, they were put, put there for safekeeping. Oh, of course. They're the heirs to the throne. You yeah. have to make sure that nothing's going to happen to them. Yeah. It, it was. Well, and we think of the Tower of London today as being this place of execution, of imprisonment. Mm-hmm. It had been the royal palace in, like, the Middle Ages. Right. Yeah, that is where the kings and queens lived and worked. It's they, they have the royal apartments. They're very plush. They're very nice. It's the London stronghold for the it royal is. family. On the river, it's very easy to get to. Uh, it's you know very well fortified. It was the it was nice. It's where they they lived. Oh yay! Thank you. Thank you so much, thank Devin. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So it's it's a very nice palace. And not until do we have, you know, from farther back until we have other royal palaces, such as, um, you know, Hampton Court is built after that. Or, I mean, yes, it's definitely built after that. Um, and you also have Whitehall Palace, which is pretty much gone now. Uh, there's still a little bit of it left, but mostly gone due to fire. Uh, Windsor at this time is there, but kinda, it's, it's like but it's, it's not really not the city. Windsor yet. The Windsor that we think of today has a lot more Regency influence than actual medieval influence. Mm. Um, the really only like super old part of that is the, the uh, giant rotunda tower. Um, and then parts of it are also older, but it's it's pretty far out of the city at that right. point. Um, and Buckingham Palace was 1600s, right? Buckingham Palace? Buckingham does not become the royal residence until the 1830s. That's so right. Because, but it's, because it belonged to the... It was just the house. Buckingham. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... That's, that's where, yeah, where that's they were living, and it made sense because that was one of the royal residences mm-hmm. where a lot of people lived and stayed. Uh, so it was not unusual for them to be hanging out there. Yeah, yeah. It's a but... very well fortified royal palace. Yeah. So not too unusual, but also no. great for when you want to keep people out of sight. Yes. That too. <laughs> so let's see. Our next question comes from our Turkish friend, uh, Feb. And they're talking about World War One in this wow. question. So we'll probably go to Glenn for this one. They say, as far as I know, the Battle of... I'm going to be terrible at pronouncing Gallipoli. this. Uh, Kanakal? Kanakal? Uh, seemed simple for the British, although they were strong, and the Turks were also very weak. How did the British lose in the face of this weakness? So let me look up this. Is it can it, is that the is that the smaller battle that surrounded the Gallipoli Peninsula? Is that the one I'm thinking of? Let's find out. Let's see. It's a city and seaport in Turkey, but let me find the actual battle. So World War One. So, let's see. The Gallipoli campaign. Okay, yes, yes. okay. Woo! I was almost <laughs> right. So, you're right. There, at, at a certain point, let me back up. World War I. <laughs> right? Western Front. Zoom in. 
the French, the British, the Germans are all there in the trenches, as Winston Churchill said, chewing on barbed wire, and they can't break out. They can't win. So uh, several people, Churchill in the lead, says, instead of chewing barbed wire in the Western Front, why don't we create another another front and go into the uh, the German, Turkish, Austrian, Austro-Hungarian alliance another way, perhaps a waterway, a waterway, which we could then put the British Royal Navy to use, right? Because right at this point, halfway through the war, the British Royal Navy is kind of just hanging out. They're the most powerful surface fleet in the world by a lot, but they're not doing anything. They're not doing anything active, and so the Navy is desperate to do something. So they work with the Army, they get some some uh, ships together, and the, the idea is to go up. Uh, through the Dardanelles uh, to the Bosphorus, take Constantinople and kick Turkey out of the war. Simple. And Turkey doesn't remotely have the Navy that the British does. Uh, do. They don't remotely have a well-trained, well-equipped professional army either compared to the British and the French who come to Gallipoli to help. Even with, you know, in the, the Australians, they bring the Australians in to take part in the Gallipoli campaign. So, it seems like a foregone conclusion. The British certainly thought so until they landed and things started to go horribly. But what happens is, is it turns out the Turkish may not have a lot of ships. The Turks may not have a lot of ships. They've got a lot of mines that they can put across the Dardanelles, number one. And shore batteries that they can fire at ships going through. So any British or French ship trying to make it to the Dardanelles is going to run a gauntlet a fire and they keep trying to break through the Darnells and they they can't do it they basically chicken out because they don't want to lose their precious naval battleships mm -hmm. so they decide to land on the Gallipoli Peninsula they land in a horrible spot and they try to take the height so they can take those uh, coastal guns from the rear seems like the the Turkish army is going to be defeated except there are a couple of fantastic divisional commanders who through their uh, dedication through their genius totally turned things around for the Turks. And one of those is uh, a Kemal Ataturk. Uh, well, he, he takes the name Ataturk later when he helps found the modern nation state of Turkey. But he is one of those uh, commanders of the Turkish army that holds out. He's able to get supplies where they go. And Gallipoli is horrible for everyone involved, right? Not just for the Australians, the diggers, is you know, the Anzac troops that are there. But the Turkish troops are in horrific conditions as well. They're low on food, ammunition, equipment, and everything. And what ends up happening is that the British simply can't win. The Turks simply hold out. They hold the high ground. They hold those coastal fortifications. Um, the British Navy is not willing to run the gauntlet. And by this point, the Navy is starting to say, we need to go do other things in other places in the world. The British Army sees that it's getting itself into a just as bad a position as it is on the Western Front. So eventually, and in a great ironic twist, the best part of the British experience and the Australian experience on the Gallipoli campaign from a military perspective is the very well organized and disciplined withdrawal from the peninsula where they all kind of sneak out at night, get on their ships, and they sail away. Dardanelles safe. Bosphorus safe, Istanbul safe, right? Done. Turkish Empire defeats uh, not just the British, of course, but you know the French are on this expedition too because they're allies, and so you know the ability, what the Turks were able to accomplish there, sends this huge boost of confidence through the through the Turkish nation and the Turkish military. They, however, get bogged down in the Arabian Peninsula and in some of the things going on with Russia. But that's a that's a whole other part that I've can't go into right now because we don't have time but that's a fantastic question yes and you and, and you probably i would hope and, and please share this with us i don't know how much of this is actually covered in, in turkish schools how much of the the turkish experience is covered in in, in world war one is covered in schools it's very it, it's a fascinating subject and i would be interested to know how much is you know shared yeah let us know feb and thank you for your question and for joining us today we also have another regular here, Fried. Hey! hey. Where have you been? Yeah. <laughs> Fried says, finally, we're all on summertime together and I can watch again. So we're happy to have you back, our, our German friend. <laughs> and you know what? I don't know if it's ever dawned on me. Is it, 
I've been saying fried this whole time as an American, but is it freed? Is it freed? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next question, we're going to go to our one of our YouTube viewers, uh, Karen. And Karen asks, uh, was Eleanor Roosevelt's part in the develop, what was Eleanor Roosevelt's part in the development and implementation of Planned Parenthood? So I don't know too much about this, but I was doing a little bit of uh, Googling in case y'all weren't familiar, but uh, it does look like she was, she was at least a financial and vocal supporter um, of Planned Parenthood in its earlier days. And um, I mean, we do know, of course, she was a pretty visible advocate for women's rights as well as uh, di uh, minorities yeah, American and American Americans. Yes. Um, what do y'all, do y'all know any connections to specifically to her efforts with like women's reproductive rights of this early, early time? As, as, as they say in the academic world, when they want to chicken out of something, that's not my area. <laughs> that's um, not my area. But yeah, so I, I don't know, uh, and I, I know practically nothing about Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, role in that aspect of American society. Do you? Not particularly other than she was a very vocal advocate for, for women um, and their rights. And it, and she was specifically, I mean, she did she did support um, Planned Parenthood along with, looks like uh, someone we were discussing in our homeschool connection class yeah. the other day, Mary McLeod Bethune as well. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we could we can dive in a little bit more on, on Eleanor Roosevelt because I think that would be an excellent person to mm -hmm. do a, a program on um because she did seem to be you know very much a, a social reformer of her right. time and used her position to do a lot of activism yeah oh yeah so very cool yeah, thank you karen it's, it, you know to, to say something um not terribly flattering to anyone but it turns out it turns out great for the united states that you know her and franklin relationship was not very good at all oh really and I so did not for know that. much of the time he was in the white house they uh, they were rarely in the same there. room much less and so she wanted to get out and travel and go do things and he was like go ahead i'm running a war <laughs> and so she went and did all these things yes. right i'm running the, I'm, I'm trying to fix the depression go do your thing and stay out of my hair and so she did and so she had a vast amount of freedom from um that was sort of unprecedented for a first lady, right? The first lady usually had to stay around the house and be the, the hostess for all the social things mm -hmm. and everything, but because they did not want to be around each other, she yeah. went and flitted everywhere <laughs> and was able to get her fingers in all sorts of things like yeah. this, right? that, that started to make a, a really big difference. And, you know, that's, and so her story has come down to us on so many of these different social issues. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, but again, that's, that's the unfortunate side of human relations in history. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, at least she kept herself busy. With that's that right. Stuff. <laughs> she did good stuff. And she would still some like she would report back to FDR saying, oh, like, yeah. "Hey, like this is what's going on here." Right. But it was more of a professional than a yeah. personal relationship. They didn't almost. hate each. I don't think they hated each other. They just yeah, they just they didn't like each other. Well, at that, I mean, she, at that yeah. point, they just. I'm not sure if I would say like they were definitely no longer in love yeah. or in a romantic relationship right. yeah but they tolerated each other yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah i'm not somewhere between like like and and hate i would yes. say how do you do, like, how, do, you do? Yes. how do you do yes <laughs> I, I feel like it, it you know depends on the day is probably where their, <laughs> right. their radar probably. needle was between like yeah. i like you today i hate you tomorrow right yeah and of course they're also situation. both under a whole lot of pressure lots so. of stress <laughs> lots of stress all right, so uh, Stacy, we're gonna go to Stacy's question now. This is a good one. Uh, what is the strangest historical holiday tradition that you've come across um, that was fairly widespread? So strange holiday traditions um, that were fairly widespread. I'll let y'all hmm. when think they think on about it. it. Hiding boiled eggs in your yard is kind of weird. <laughs> 
I'm just when saying. do you think about it? And that's coming up, folks. So that's right. <laughs> just zoom out and think a- and look at it a little objectively. <laughs> it's kind of weird. You know, like I, I love hiding Easter eggs. I think oh, it's, it's so, much so fun. fun. When I was little, I would make my mom hide them around the house so I could practice. <laughs> like I love hiding Easter eggs. But when you objectively think about it, hiding boiled eggs in your yard. It's a little weird. It's a little weird. Yeah, it's a little yeah. weird. That's a good good point. Good yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. Or like bringing a tree inside and decorating it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Prince Albert. Yes. Yes. So Prince Albert made that happen. Yeah. yeah. His, that was a German tradition? That was, yeah, it was a German tradition. Yeah. But yeah, what about, um, okay, I have seen this whole thing about hanging like a pickle ornament and yeah. I don't know where it comes from. The Bartlett's from. do that. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, uh that I can't remember. That's that's older than you think it is. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. expect so. But I can't remember exactly where that I think it's you know, also that, that German. From. And what about Krampus? Is that oh, from the office the or is that no, real? real? No, that's real. Okay. That's, no, that's real. Krampus is real, as is Belschnickel. Belschnickel. Yes. Belschnickel. <laughs> okay. Belschnickel is because those here. seemed a little like off putting because I was like, so punished again, kids. German. Yeah. Right? But, yes. but 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 they you know they, the the idea is to scare children into behaving. Uh, and if you'll notice, uh, Americans have certainly taken to the Krampus Belschnickel thing in the last ten or fifteen years. Yeah. Uh, probably. Probably a little from bit. The office had something to do well, with that. Well, yeah, Krampus right. has been around for a while because certain people get grumpy around Christmas. <laughs> you know? And they need something to cling to. Need, yeah. Oh, I just saw that. Yes, the uh, <laughs> the pickle in the tree is, is German, like you said, yeah. and goes back to the 16th century. Yeah. Oh, and of course... Uh, Fried, which is really freed, freed. I've learned. Yes, freed, perfect. Um, <laughs> says uh, Christmas pickle. When I heard that people in America think that's a German tradition, I was rolling on the floor laughing. That's the weirdest one. Ah, so perhaps we, <laughs> maybe back in the day it was, but us Americans, we've really uh, clung on to it. And uh, Freed also says uh, Krampus is a legend in the Alpine region and actually awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I it. yes. I love it. Now I am, I'm trying to rack my head if there's any other uh, holiday traditions. I mean, of course, we're thinking about a lot of Christmas traditions. Right. Um, and a or, lot of those are German or Germanic. Yeah. Because, just because. Or there's, the, you know, the Maypole when you dance around the, the pole with the right. strings. I want, you know, when you, when you also think about it, I don't know when it started that you would uh, get a birthday cake with the candles uh, equal to your oh. number of years on the planet. <laughs> yeah, And then right. you're supposed to blow them out. I don't know when that started, but that is also... You've given us some uh, something to think about for right. like unusual <laughs> traditions or just like the origins of yeah. uh, common holiday traditions. Some, sometimes they start crazy. You've heard the legend of the, uh, uh, the family who, when they would make the roast for Christmas, would always like traditionally cut it in half and bake it in two pans right and and the, they're showing the daughter like the daughter's like well why do you do that because because our you, you know my mother and grandmother always used to do that it's just it just seems like a family tradition that <laughs> yeah. we do and she's like why do you do that and mom says i don't know you know what i'm gonna call i'm gonna call your mom i'm gonna call my mom your, your grandmother and ask and she's she calls she says i don't know i don't know why i would do that let me call my mom and find out and she said, you know, Mom, have, this tradition of cutting the roast in half and cooking it in two pans, um, did Grandmother do that? And she says, yes, yeah, she did. And she says, why? She says, because the roast we got was always too big for one pan, so we had to use two. <laughs> why is this a tradition? <laughs> I but, love that. But there you go. Oh, that's really funny. Because the pan was too small. <laughs> yep, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and I'm reporting back with Olivia's five nation builders. Okay. Oh, okay. Number one, Olivia says, is Thomas Jefferson. All okay. Right. Number two, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh-huh. All right. Number three, Abraham Lincoln. Oh. Uh-huh. Number four, Teddy Roosevelt. All right. And number five, Mansa Musa. I don't know who that is. Do you know? Mansa Musa. Mansa. Let me look that up because I'm not exactly sure who that is. So let's Google that real quick. Mansa Musa was the 10th century Mansa of the Mali Empire, an Islamic West African state. But what was his story? What was he all about? 
Um, he has been described as the wealthiest individual in all human uh, history. See, Olivia's right. smart. She's got a bankroll. <laughs> we didn't even think yeah. of that. <laughs> and Olivia also says uh, their nation would be called the Nation of Rhea, named after the person who founded Alexander. Did I get that correct? Rhea? Rhea? R-E-A-H? R-E-A. Perhaps. So. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. We'll but yeah, no, that's smart. You thought of the money. We should have done that. Yeah. There's a good nonprofit. Job, you. You'd think we we could totally do that. Yeah. We're just not. <laughs> Slipped our mind. We're just used yes. for asking other people. Yeah. Uh, As a reminder, we have a March <laughs> donation <Yes>. goal. <laughs> if you would Please like to. Please fund our country. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Help fund our nation. <laughs> Glendonia and the independent states and, of, of the United Peoples. Of the United Peoples. Glendonia yes. and Ice Soup. Ice Soup. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next question comes from our Welsh friend, David. David asks, you use the dollar in America today, but before the UK got, shall we say, asked to leave, <laughs> was British currency ever used? So talk to us oh. about colonial currency. I'm so glad you asked. I love this topic. How, much, how long do we have left? Uh, yeah, 15 10, minutes. Yeah. We got it. Okay, yeah. this will only take 30. So <laughs> um, there are two types of currency. There is you know, uh, specie currency, which is actual gold and or silver coins, sometimes copper, that have intrinsic value, right? If you have a silver shilling, then the shilling, even if you hit it, beat it, burn it, bend it, that amount of silver is still worth a shilling. So that's specie shilling. Then there's also paper money, right? Paper money is supposed to be based on specie money somewhere, mm -hmm. but not necessarily in your hand because it, it's a means of exchange. Um, so, in the New World, uh, remember the, the, the British colonies, their purpose was to enrich the mother country, right? So, in enriching the mother country, you don't want your liquid specie to go out of the country. You want more to come in. And so, long story short, in the colonies, it was very rare to have uh, British coin currency. It, it existed. Right? It was there, but it only went up in, in terms of availability, usually around the time of war. Like the French and Indian War, they were importing a lot of it so that they could you know, move the economy and fight the war. But at other times, Britain had very specific laws to keep specie coinage from leaving England, so it did not come over here. So we had to rely either on paper bills issued by the respective col uh, colonial governments which was highly regulated by the uh, by the British Parliament, or we could use other coins from other countries, such as you know German dollars and Spanish uh, Spanish dollars and Portuguese and French and things like that, because that was not limited by British law to to move freely as a means of exchange in, in the colonies. Oh my goodness, y'all, sorry. I, we have to interrupt because uh, Love You, a, a fantastic band, has raided us oh with, no. with I mean, 74, 74 viewers. 74 people. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, everyone. Oh my goodness. Uh, y'all, to, to all of our Facebook followers and our YouTube viewers as well, we are also on Twitch, and that is a streaming platform. And Love You uh, is a fantastic duo of improv musicians um, that have discovered us. <laughs> very happy for that. So, Love You, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. We will stick around a little, a little longer if y'all are okay with it uh, yeah. for your questions. So... Uh, everybody, this is Lo-Fi History, where we answer your history questions along to some sweet, sweet beats. And we have uh, Marie. Hello, Marie. Hello. And we have Glenn. Hi, Glenn. And I'm Libba. And if you have a history question, do go ahead and chat it. We usually go from, from uh, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, so we are near the end of our hour, but... Thank you so much to all of these lovely yeah. follows yeah. as well from Loki Bear, from uh, Obsidium, from Bardic Perspiration, <laughs> <laughs> from Love You, from uh, all of these wonderful folks. Thank you so much. I apologize if we can't get all of the shout outs in time, uh, but thank you so much. You thank are you. supporting thank a you. wonderful museum. <laughs> We're the Northeast Georgia History Center. We're in Gainesville, Georgia, and we host Lo-Fi History every Tuesday at 4 p.m. 
and we're here to answer your history questions and to uh, in hang a out. fun way. In a fun Not in way. Not in a let's do your homework way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all, I will be paying attention to the chat. Uh, so if you do have any questions for us, we do have a few in the queue. But if you join us uh, next week, we will be sure to answer your question as well. Hello, Calicot. I know I see some uh, familiar faces okay. here. <laughs> So, uh, wow, what what an honor. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, I did interrupt you, Glenn. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. So, um, let me see if I can cut this. Uh, get. Let me get we, to the point. We were talking about uh, colonial, colonial era money in money. America, in the Americas. In the, yes. yes. So, so the British coins did not come over here. A lot of paper money from the uh, respective colonial governments. But if I'm in Massachusetts and someone's trying to hand me paper money from, say, Virginia or South Carolina, that may be meaningless to me. Why would I take that? There's no guarantee that it has value and things like that. So specie coin is still something is the most prized means of exchange. Can't use British coins very much, so you have these to the colonial, uh, colonial area, foreign coins, especially a lot of Spanish. We call them pieces of eight, right? Because the, the British had raided a whole lot of uh, British silver ships and had uh, the, co the colonists did a lot of trade with areas under the control of Spain. So there are a lot of Spanish reals, of dollars, uh, and, and things like that moving through the American economy. And there are, every year they print up like sheets that say, well, if you have a Massachusetts one pound note, it's worth so many actual British pounds, so many Spanish dollars, so many German dollars, so many French ecu and things like that, so people could keep up with what the rates of exchange were. The silver coins that were moving in the United, it's not like in when we won our independence from Great Britain, suddenly all that stopped and we went straight to the US dollar, not even close. Those Spanish silver dollars, there were so many of them in circulation and they were such a popular currency, we, those were considered legal tender in the United States until about 1850. You still see a lot of those moving around because they're silver, they have intrinsic value. So that's the story of British currency in the, in the Americas in a nutshell. <laughs> yes, and speaking of in a nutshell, for all of our new followers on Twitch, you should also check us out on YouTube and Facebook. Just look us up on uh, as the Northeast Georgia History Center. I will put it in the chat as Yay. well because we have uh, live streams every Wednesday at 2 p.m. And in fact, Marie, you will be portraying a Georgia loyalist during yes. the American Revolution tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern. Yes, I will. So we do hope that you will join <laughs> us for that as well. Okay, so uh, again, thank you so much, love you, for the raid. It, yes. it's, it's such an honor. Now, let me see if we do have any questions um, from our, our new followers. <laughs> Bardic Perspiration asks, which year was the best year? 1066. Ah, uh, yes, we all knew that. <laughs> and if you want to know why, you can you can watch last week's uh, live stream all about the Bayou Tapestry, which uh, depicts the uh, events surrounding the Norman Conquest yes. in the year 1066. Yes, there are three people on your screen, and one of them has been fascinated with the Norman Conquest and all the things around it since they were a child. And so... That's why I picked that year so very quickly. It's a yes. fun year. <laughs> if you like conquest and death and armies bashing each other's heads in and things like that. Oh, nice. Yes, you know. <laughs> it's history, right? Oh, and Metso Heather says they're in Brazelton. Yes, come oh, on down. Yes. You can visit us. Yes, please. <laughs> come on down to the Northeast Georgia History yeah. Center. Oh, Josh, uh, you, Josh says um, his mom just donated $10 to meet Yay! our March Yay! goal. Yay! Thank you so much, Josh, uh, one of our awesome Homeschool Connection kids. Um, and Josh has a question, so we might as well take Josh's question. All right. So Josh says, I've got a question for y'all. Right. If Germany in World War II managed to get to the oil in modern day Azerbaijan, I'm terrible at that. Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, would they have managed to win against the Soviet Union? <sighs> no. 
<laughs> Short answer. No, Short because answer. I mean you're right. That was that was one of the big reasons that they invaded the Soviet Union is to swerve everything to the south and get to the Romanian oil fields and the Caucasus and things like that, right? And that was that was one of the things that they really needed was a fuel source that can continue to fuel their their war machine. Um, however, the Soviet Union was just too big, right? And this is, and when you look at a map, this is a, a gross generalization, but when you look at a map going from Germany into the Soviet Union, the map sort of, if this is down here, sort of the border with Germany and Poland, and as you move further into the Soviet Union, it goes out like this, right? And <laughs> swallows Marie's head. Yeah. But, but that means it, when you move out like that, and as you keep trying to, to conquer the territory and conquer the territory and, and occupy it, you have to expand your lines further and further and further. And you have to have more and more men and tanks and planes and trucks and all this sort of thing to do it. Germany simply wasn't big enough to take and hold and occupy the amount of land that they were trying to get that would have those oil fields in them. And German war production was simply not, to use the fantastically different example, not American war production. It wasn't British war produ production. It was only slightly better than the Soviet war production for a lot of different reasons. They made great stuff, but their stuff was so good it took a long time to, to get done. They were not a mass production kind of place the way so many of their the uh, the allies were. So to, I mean that's just to, to answer your question. No, my, you know in my <laughs> humble opinion, I don't I don't think um, it, the Germans would have been very hard pressed to have taken the Soviet Union and held onto any significant part of it for any significant length of time. I have an apology to make. That was not Josh. That was a different Josh. But Josh from Homeschool oh, okay. Connections <laughs> is still with us. So okay. <laughs> thank you to the Popple family and to uh, the the right Josh. Oh, the, oh, Josh Popple. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. I haven't seen you in forever. Big fan, though. We know that. <laughs> That's right, man. Good to yes. hear from you guys. So welcome to both Joshes. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, this is a good question. So Mr. Ego on Twitch asks, why does Europe slash Scandinavia like bonfires so much? Now, I would imagine this might have some pagan roots to it, bonfires and such, but do we have any idea uh, about that tradition of gathering around a fire? Well, it's cold in Scandinavia. You got a lot of trees. <laughs> you got a lot of trees. Um... Yes, and you know this is this goes back and, and it extends beyond Scandinavian or European culture. There's something about fire there really and is. people gathering around it, right? Whether it's a small family family unit, whether it's a community, and it just it's this basic, dare I say, genetically coded thing within all of us, right? It's just it's just something that exists. Uh, the fire gives warmth, the fire brings us together, it illuminates the night, uh, and you see that, like I said, that's, that's pretty much as universal as you can get across world cultures, I think. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think Scandinavians have really good marketing. Uh, you know, <laughs> they, and so, so it's probably why we think of it coming from there, but, but the idea is, is, is universal. Yeah, definitely. Say. I mean, that's just uh, something to linger on as well as <laughs> the history of fire. <laughs> what it, what it has, how it has impacted culture, but also yes. how it's advanced cultures. Uh, Thanks, over Prometheus. Time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's see, we are getting near the end of our time today. So we're going to take um, our last two questions. And before we do, I'm also going to put a link in the chat to our live stream tomorrow so that y'all can. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, subscribe to that and enjoy Marie's portrayal of Elizabeth Johnston, the loyalist. So um, let's see, we've got uh, Karen on Facebook asks, in, let's see, in the movie Time Machine, um, the protagonist came back, came back and took three books. If you could hop in a time machine, uh, what do you, what would you, what three books would you take? Am I taking them with me or going to get them and you're, bringing them back? I think you're going to get them and oh. bring them back. Yeah. So, I mean, this might be a good opportunity for some some lost 
I'm just going Darn to the Library it. of Alexandria. <laughs> You're just you gonna... can still only bring three back. I know, but then I can go and decide which three. It's a good starting place. And for anyone, Marie, can you tell us, um, for anyone who's not familiar with the Library of Alexandria, just quickly, what, what was that? So it was a giant library <laughs> in? in Alexandria <laughs> and just, you know, basics. Um, and it was a, a center of, of culture and, and learning that was destroyed. Um, was that destroyed by Alexandria? No. No, who was that destroyed? Uh, it was destroyed, well, it was destroyed a couple of different times, to be uh. perfectly honest, through series of conquests. Um, you know, the spread of Islam undid some of it. Uh, just general wars in the area undid some of it. Uh, but yes, it was considered the greatest repository of written learning in the known world. And a lot of it got destroyed through those various conquests. Usually there's, you know, one where it's depicted now in, in different um, paintings and, and illustrations of it burning and it being burned. Um, but... We only have a few things that survive mm. from the entire library. It was so sad. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Yeah, what would you do, Glenn? Gosh. Aristotle's comedies. Oh, nice. Yeah. Now, have a lot of those been lost? They've all been lost. They've all been lost. We've got some of his tragedies, but none of his comedies. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> For... that's too, yeah, that's too bad. For fun on a movie on this, see Name of the Rose. Uh, I would also bring back um, Alfred the Great's uh, translation of Consolation of Philosophy, just because it would be cool to have that in his own hand. Yeah. That means I would yeah. have to steal it, which is why we don't have it now, because I brought it back to the future. <sighs> uh, Bardic Perspiration says Hypatia's Diary. I don't know who Hypatia is. That would be a cool one too. <laughs> who is Hypatia? Uh, Hypa is it Hypatia or Hippolyta? Oh, I, I, I can't. Hip um, let's see. Let's find out. Hypatia. Hypatia was a Hellenistic neo neoplatonist philosopher and astronomer and mathematician who yes. lived in Alexandria, Egypt. Yes. I mean, you know what? When it comes down to it, maybe you're right. Maybe we just go back to Alexandria yeah. and grab three books just and grab, get back. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're probably going to be awesome and lost to us today. Exactly. Yeah, right. And so. how can I know what I don't know? So yeah. I'm just going to go there and I'm going to grab stuff. Well, what you want to do is find the. You know that they had a room of the cool books. Oh, right? they, every library does. Go to the room of the cool books, break the cases, <laughs> yes. take those books, yeah. hop back in the time machine. There you they go. It might be more like scrolls if you go to Alexandria. Yeah. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Same difference. Yes. All right. Well, that seems like as good as an answer to end on as any. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much again. Love you for the raid. Yes, thank um, you. We will go ahead and choose another Twitch streamer to raid. Looks like Tom Thinks is on, so I think that would be a nice family-friendly raid for all of us. And, and if you haven't got a chance to check him out, uh, and thanks for getting to our goal. Yes, yeah, so and thank you so goal. much to everyone who donated. That uh, we actually extended this goal for this month um, to 300, and y'all helped us get there. And of course. Um, if you would like to uh, add to our goal, we are a nonprofit, and your contributions definitely help us um, to continue all of our educational programs here. I'm putting a link again in all of the chats. Yay. And for our Twitch folks, hang around. We are going to raid Tom Thanks, who does live animation and is a family-friendly streamer. So let's go ahead and start that raid. Thank you again to everyone for joining us today. We will see you again uh, next Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. All right, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks.